Pot Stirrer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. In middle school, I had an English teacher, Miss Klosterman, who would assign us a major research paper every year. We could pick just about any topic, but it had to be well researched, and we had to include actual books and source our information properly. It was pretty structured. We had to go to the library, use a card catalog, and record bibliographies on index cards. We had to write outlines and write our research papers. In seventh grade, I wrote about the history of racism in the United States, which was way too long. In eighth grade, I wrote about Canadian government. But it's a memory that sticks out to me because these were building blocks to learning how to research properly, vet information, and think critically. As Americans, how many of us have the ability or the will to think critically anymore, to have healthy skepticism, but have the flexibility and humility to change our minds when we are proven wrong? I am your host, Jay Poole. One of the big stories in the past week has been that special counsel Robert Mueller has impaneled a new grand jury in Washington, D.C. in the course of the investigation into the Trump campaign's dealings with the Russian government and any role it had in Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. There's already a grand jury in Arlington, Virginia, that is investigating as well that Mueller has access to. So besides the congressional investigations into the Russian scandal, there are two grand juries investigating the campaign's connections with Russia, and this may indicate an expanding scope to this investigation. Having a grand jury expand their scope is not a novel concept. This happened during the Bill Clinton administration, as special counsel Ken Starr started with the Whitewater real estate scandal and the expansion of the investigative scope led to the Monica Lewinsky scandal and Clinton's resulting impeachment. The fact that Trump's campaign has had dealings with Russia should not be in dispute. According to the New York Times, in June 2016, there was a meeting held between members of Trump's campaign, including his son, Donald Trump Jr., son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and then-campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and a small group of Russian representatives, including Kremlin-connected lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya, in Trump Tower with Daddy Trump in the building, though not at the meeting. Donald Trump Jr. no longer denies the meeting took place, although he did initially. He stated that the purpose was Russian adoption, then later changed his statement to admitting it was about intel against the Clinton campaign, but it wasn't of any consequence. He also attempts to excuse it by calling it opposition research and stating that this is standard in political campaigns. But campaign veterans in both parties disagree. While opposition research is common, meeting with a foreign nation, especially one that we have tensions with, to obtain information on a political opponent is definitely not. In many state, it would be reported to the FBI if they were approached. The Mueller investigation is continuing to chug along while the president, for his part, is attempting to deflect, stating it's sour grapes for an election that Democrats lost. The point is not if Russian interference changed the course of the election. The point is that the current administration was working with foreign agents to sway the election, and now that they are in office, are still treating them with kid gloves. This is an attack on our democracy, an attack on free and fair elections, and now on sovereign governance. It's telling that one thing that Republicans and Democrats could agree on overwhelmingly is Russian sanctions and limiting Trump's power to lift them. Trump went kicking and screaming into signing a bipartisan bill that included Russian sanctions and lashed out at Republicans for not protecting him. Even if we can expect a slow investigation, as Mueller has stated, Trump's behavior is as a man who is feeling the walls closing in. Potstirer Podcast will be back after this.
Did you know for today's episode? The Department of State, led by Secretary Rex Tillerson, is a cabinet-level department charged with cultivating diplomatic relations with countries all over the world, representing the United States of America. The State Department sends out diplomats to various nations, represents and assists Americans through our embassies run in these countries, meets with foreign leaders and representatives, and is generally focused on fostering friendly relations and achieving peaceful resolutions to conflict. Here is their most recent mission statement. The department's mission is to shape and sustain a peaceful, prosperous, just, and democratic world and foster conditions for stability and progress for the benefit of the American people and people everywhere. This mission is shared with the USAID, ensuring we have a common path forward in partnership as we invest in a shared security and prosperity that will ultimately better prepare us for the challenges of tomorrow. But did you know that the State Department is working on rewriting the mission statement with drafts omitting the terms just and democratic? According to the Washington Post, Tillerson has ordered his staff to come up with new mission, purpose, and ambition statements for the State Department. Drafts have included We promote the security, prosperity, and interests of the American people globally. Lead America's foreign policy through global advocacy, action, and assistance to shape a safer, more prosperous world. The American people thrive in a peaceful and interconnected world that is free, resilient, and prosperous. The removal of terminology that refers to justice and democracy appears to be intentional, as is the promotion of safety and prosperity. Critics point out that this is sending the message that the United States is no longer desiring a just and democratic world. It also appears that the State Department, as part of the Trump administration, wants to bring America's mission in line with the leadership of countries Trump is more fond of, such as Russia. Russia, an oligarchy, has advanced a focus on security and prosperity, so this change in focus appears to be no accident. It's also an interesting development considering the president's domestic push for law and order and the advancement of the police state over reforming our justice system to advance fair treatment for all Americans, as well as the advocacy of voter suppression efforts in the name of voter integrity. Some are sounding the alarm that we are in the middle of a coup, considering all these changes, including this one. They may not be wrong. Now, back to Potster Podcast. I am an exennial, part of the tweener micro-generation between Generation X and Millennials. Exennials are old enough to remember the Cold War and young enough that September 11th is our Where Were You When moment. Exennials remember a time before computers, cell phones, and other fixtures of today's technology were commonplace, but are young enough to at least spend some time using modern technology in our youth old enough to grow up without having to worry about social media, including the ubiquitous trolling, sexting, and cyberbullying, but young enough to have adapted to the reality that everything is digital. I grew up in a family that had a computer, which was not so common back in the 80s and 90s, an Apple IIe, then a Tandy PC. For a time, we had Prodigy, which was a forerunner of internet service providers like AOL and Earthlink which we also had at a later point in time. As a teenager, I had the opportunity to observe some of the earliest testing of GPS technology while attending a summer program at Michigan State University. In high school, I would hang out with my group of friends. Only one of us had a cell phone at the time, and it wasn't me. It was a Nokia that only made staticky phone calls. But for the most part, If you're out and about and you need to call someone, you look for a payphone and you made sure you had change. 
And as far as information was concerned, we had the library. Today, we have the internet in the palm of our hands if we need anything. News stories, events, restaurant suggestions, directions, the weather, talking points, statistics, anything. We can find it. The internet is awesome in that it democratizes information. We can find anything, and we can put our own voices out there and find our own followings. But I think that as a society, we're losing the ability to discern good information from bad and the ability to think critically. It's very easy to create our own echo chambers. We follow people on Twitter or Instagram we agree with. We unfollow or defriend real-life, lifelong friends on Facebook if they support the wrong group of people or say something we disagree with politically. We read certain websites, watch certain channels, listen to certain podcasts. (laughs) Because we don't want to hear viewpoints that don't agree with our worldview. And this is really bad for our society. You may ask why this is a bad thing. Well, Jay, you have strong opinions. You think the other side is wrong, so how are you any different? Eh, I think that's fair. But I would say this. There's a difference between understanding other viewpoints and considering them all equally valid. It's important to understand other viewpoints, but not all views are equally valid. Making a judgment of validity comes from evaluating facts and thinking critically. Echo chambers lead to a lack of understanding. Lack of understanding is ignorance. But if you consider viewpoints critically, not all hold water at the end of the day. Critical thinking is a strength. Echo chambers are a sign of weakness. The bad thing about echo chambers is that citizens can be led astray and they will never know because they don't have the will to find out. Sometimes it means clinging to the hopes of seeing bad policy go into effect that the leader himself doesn't care about, as has been revealed about Trump and the wall. As a transcript of his call to Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto has revealed, And sometimes it can tear the social fabric of a country apart. Last Thursday, Donald Trump kicked off his two-and-a-half-week-long vacation with a rally in West Virginia, not a tour campaigning for a congressional bill or on behalf of another candidate currently running for political office, but a rally in honor of himself, reliving the 2016 campaign as he's wont to do. At the rally, he said this. They can't beat us at the voting booths. So they're trying to cheat you out of the future and the future that you want. They're trying to cheat you out of the leadership you want with a fake story that is demeaning to all of us. And most importantly, demeaning to our country and demeaning to our constitution. Trump rallies. Why is he holding rallies for himself less than a year into his presidential term? Besides that, he's framing the Russian investigation as an attack on Trump's supporters. This is manipulation and incitement. When we elect a president, we do not elect a king or a dictator or a dear leader above the law. Presidents should never just be elected and everything they have done, are doing, and continue to do should escape any accountability because the people voted. The President of the United States is the leader of the executive branch. In the system of checks and balances, the President's chief job is to enact laws. A President should be able to go in the kind of direction their voters expect but should operate with all Americans' best interests in mind, including those Americans who did not vote for them. I've never believed in the idea of a mandate. Previous presidents, Democrat and Republican, have used that statement to declare decisive victory and, by extension, impose their will. Mandate ignores the needs of those who did not vote for them, but should still have their rights, 
liberties, and well-being respected and represented. But Trump is going beyond mandate and is making the argument that any attempt to investigate him and hold him accountable is taking away the rights of those who voted for him. This is the rhetoric of authoritarian dictators, not democratically elected leaders. An attack on me is an attack on you, in the hopes that those who follow will do his bidding if it comes to it. It's incitement to unrest and civil war. At the end of each show, I always say, let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. It's not just a tagline or closing statement. Generations of Americans have risked and even lost their lives for the United States, the democratic ideal the country was built on, and to advance this democratic ideal closer to reality. Men and women have joined the United States military and have put their lives on the line for this country. We have had an abolitionist movement, a woman's suffrage movement, a civil rights movement, a gay rights movement, and men and women of all colors and all walks of life have fought for, sacrificed, and even died for the rights and liberties many of us take for granted. Freedom is not free. And we need to be willing to fight for it with all the effort it deserves. Or the sacrifices made by Americans from the founding until today will have been in vain. Hotstir Podcast is on iTunes and Google Play. Subscribe, and if you enjoy the show, please leave a review. Like Potstir Podcast on Facebook. Follow the show on Twitter at PotstirCast and Instagram at Potstir Podcast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.